All right, so this represented the car just rolling down the track. You do remember that from yesterday, right? It started from almost rest, but not quite rest. So if we look here, it started at, you know, some velocity that wasn't quite zero and then ended at some velocity that was faster than where it started. And in the interim, its velocity changed in what I would say was a linear fashion. Can we agree on all of those precepts? Because they're critical for what I want you to know today. Yesterday I did some labeling here, and I don't know if you remember it, but I want to really emphasize it today. This value right here represented the velocity at time zero. We call that the initial velocity. And we're going to use a V with a small i as a subscript to say initial. Or we'll use V with a small zero to indicate velocity at time zero. I prefer the latter of those two. But either one of those can be used to, to represent the initial starting velocity. We allowed the car to roll, and the car rolled down the track for two seconds, which was our time interval. And we use a lowercase t to indicate time. At the end of the time interval, the car had achieved a new velocity, something at the end of the interval, which we'll call final velocity. and either just a V by itself or a V with a subscript F to indicate final velocity. Now, these are the things we talked about yesterday. Do you guys remember that? We said that you could find the displacement by finding the area under this graph. And we produced the idea that area for a trapezoid can be found by taking the height and the two bases. Now, I think I got further than this. I think I translated this, didn't I? We talked about this area represents displacement, and we gave the symbol for displacement. We then put in what each of those variables represented based on the picture. But this picture is a representation of what the car actually did. It's evidence, right? We saw the evidence. We, you, we presented it very clearly. Tomorrow you'll be doing it yourself. This is known as a motion equation. And we'll get to that in just a minute. I want to add to it today. But this is kind of where we left off yesterday. Do you guys feel comfortable that these are the things we discussed? Now... The first suggestion I want to make is if we know information about the motion of an object, we don't necessarily need its graph in order to be able to determine something else. I think what I'm trying to make it clear to you right now is that if I know how long the object rolled down the hill and I know what its starting speed and its final speed was, I can tell you how far it went. And we demonstrated that yesterday by showing that that predicted that the car traveled about a meter down the track. Does that seem like what we did yesterday? Well, we could make those same predictions. If you know that a car starts at a stoplight, you know, at zero and speeds up to 50 miles an hour and takes a couple of minutes to do so, you could easily put together how far the car must have traveled without needing a graph of that to see it. Bless you. Thank you. That okay so far? Well, this is clearly a straight line. You are aware of how we structure a straight line, right? Now, uh, we did this the other day for uh, the, that introductory graph thing. I want to do that for this. What is plotted on the y-axis? Velocity. This is a velocity graph. So velocity is plotted on the y-axis, which is a vector quantity. 
Let's skip m for a minute. What is plotted on the x-axis? Time. This represents our time interval. What does the b in this equation represent? Where it was at time zero. Not where it was at time zero, because this is a velocity graph. The velocity at time zero. Perfect. So this has to be v initial. Because in this function, the y-intercept is the initial velocity of the object. M represents the slope. If you'll remember, when we talk about slope, we take the units on the vertical axis and divide by the units on the horizontal axis. That was meters per second per second. Now, if you remember your Algebra 1 class, which I hope you do, when you're finding slope, this is the change in the y over the change in the x. Right? Isn't that how you find slope? Well, for us, the change in the y is the final velocity minus the initial velocity. Right? Better yet, we would just call this change in velocity. The bottom is just the time, how long it took. You guys following me so far? You guys okay so far? Well, we are going to define this. This is a rate. Anything that is compared with time is considered a rate. And the thing that is being rated is what's on top. This is the change in velocity per unit time. A better way to state that is to say that this is the rate of change of velocity. So the slope of a velocity graph is the change in velocity per unit time or the rate of change of velocity. We're going to give this a name. We're going to call it the acceleration. This is how fast you get faster or how fast you get slower. I would encourage, I'm not going to write that down. I would encourage you to write it down. Understanding acceleration is a difficult concept for a lot of students. It seems easy right now. Please bear with me. I've done this before. Please write down that acceleration is how fast you get faster or how fast you get slower. We will not use the word decelerate in this class on purpose. I will demonstrate why tomorrow, I promise. Um, what do you think a good symbol for acceleration would be? I'm thinking an A, yeah. We put a bar over it because it's a vector quantity. It has direction. It can make something, in, make it, it can make a velocity more positive or it can make a velocity more negative. Now, follow me with this. If I go over here, I can just now replace M with A for acceleration. Now, I want to make sure I emphasize something. We derived two things from this graph. We did so because we recognize the shape as being a trapezoid and we know information about a straight line. All right, that's where we got this. So I, I'm not creating this from scratch. You brought in things that you knew from prior experience and helped put this together, right? You brought in y equals mx plus b, and although it was like pulling teeth for all of you, you brought in how to calculate the area of a trapezoid, right? And that's clearly here, and I showed you the evidence of where it came from, right? I want to directly from here, if you plot velocity and time, you get a linear function. Put all this together. We have two functions right now. Two 
two functions. These are known as Galileo's motion equations. They are predicated on the idea that the velocity versus time graph is linear, right? These don't exist if that wasn't a trapezoid. You understand what I'm, I'm trying to be very critical here. And if you don't understand why this is important, it's because the acceleration, the slope is constant. These only work if the acceleration is constant. If the acceleration isn't constant, you can't use any of this. Put a box around that statement, please. We will have non-constant accelerations in our future, and none of this stuff will work, but you'll use this because you'll think, I think this is important. I don't think this is particularly important. But in every physics book, they devote an entire chapter to this. You will use these a lot, and it's worth memorizing them. Now, I want to make a couple of quick statements about this, but first, do you notice that there are some shared variables between these two functions? Right? But there's also not all of them represented in both functions. For example, of the letters that are there, which one is missing in the top function? Acceleration. And which one is missing in the bottom function? Displacement. So if I want to solve for displacement, I can't use the bottom function for that, right? If I want to solve for acceleration, I can't use the top function. If I was to list them out, there are five total motion variables. We have decided that these are the important motion variables that define how we measure motion in physics. They work for one-dimensional motion. And if A is constant, then we can use these equations as a means of solving. We don't need a graph. I don't need to have a picture of the object's motion. I just need a couple of pieces of information. Now, I like putting things all in one spot. Simple, straightforward, all the motion variables and what they're called are the vectors. Time is a scalar. Do you remember your pretest, your math pretest, where you were asked to take two equations and eliminate a variable between them? Those were the two equations. Now, my, my experience is that you guys have difficulty doing that. But we're going to do that right now. We're going to eliminate a variable between them. I would like to eliminate the final velocity between them. How about I assist with it, okay? We're going to eliminate final velocity between them. So I'm going to give myself some space. To eliminate a variable, there's many ways to do that, and you have t been taught several, but we're out, of your, we're out of your element right now, so you might have difficulty recognizing what I want you to do. The easiest way to eliminate a variable for you is substitution. Come on, you keep knocking Gandalf over. I just need to get it hung up on the wall. That's right, chill Gandalf. So the easiest way for you to do it is substitution. You'll notice one of these equations is already solved for final velocity, right? So we're going to use substitution. We'll take all of this and place it where final velocity is. That's substitution. 
I'm gonna leave the vector bars off for a few minutes just so it's not super messy. So I'll get delta x equals one half times t times v initial plus a t plus v initial. That's created a new equation that has eliminated final velocity. Do you notice no final velocity there? Now, we have, we could clean this up. We could expand this and collect like terms. I would encourage you to do so. So I will show you what I mean by that. I'm gonna distribute the one half t. So I'll get one half vi times t plus one half a t squared plus one half v i times t. I just did dis you know, the distributive property, you know? Everybody okay with that? I have two like terms that I can add together. One half v i t plus one half v i t. So I will collect them. All good? Good morning, teachers and students. Please pardon this interruption. The point. So, okay, a lot of work here, and I don't mean this haphazardly. We have created something new, and I don't know that you appreciate it, but we have created something new. This is a new relationship, and it goes, it's another motion equation. It's another one of these equations. Now we have one that points out that we can find displacement without having to know how fast it's going at the end, right? This one doesn't have final velocity in it. R real motion equations only contain initial conditions. These two are real motion equations because they only contain initial conditions. Moreover, and I hope you remember this, this one is y equals mx plus b, right? We got that. This is the most important thing I'm gonna say. This is my sum up. What kind of function is this? What kind of fun, what, what's it got in it that the other one doesn't? Quadratic. It's got a quadratic, right? T is squared. That's a parabola, correct? If I plot position and time, I should get a parabola. Well, do you remember yesterday? Right? This is position versus time. It's not exponential. It is a parabola. It's exactly what is predicted by just looking at <laughs> y equals mx plus b and trapezoids. Right? That's why it works this way, which also tells you this function is delta x equals 1 half a t squared plus v initial times t. This is that function. All right. That's all I want.